Now we'll get into future prophecies, prophecies that have yet to be fulfilled in the future. And there are events going on today and trends that are happening that seem to indicate that these things, these fulfilled prophecies are on the way. So that also is evidence for the Bible. So we are on prophecies to be fulfilled in the future. And I'm just going to touch on certain ones of them, certain major ones, but there's much more than this and much more to study and look at than what I'm saying. But I'm just giving you a quick look and, and, and there you can see some of the trends that we can expect. Now, there is... There are prophecies of great and powerful dominant kingdoms mentioned in Daniel 2, 31 to 45. And this was when uh, Daniel was serving in the court of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar had a dream about this big statue, and he didn't know what it meant. And he uh, asked his astrologers and fortune tellers, and they didn't know what it meant. And finally, he, he said, okay, well, I'm just going to kill all of you unless you find someone who can actually tell me the dream, in addition to interpreting the dream. And they said, well, no one can do that. But then Daniel came forth and said, yes, God can reveal these things. And Daniel told him the dream and then gave the interpretation. And this dream was about coming about kingdoms of the world. And this was from Daniel, as I said, Daniel 2, uh, 31 to 45. Your majesty looked, and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly made of iron and partly baked clay. While you're watching, a rock was cut out, but not of he by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were all broken to pieces and became like chaff on the threshing floor of the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream, and now we will interpret it to the king. Your majesty, you are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands he has placed all mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds of the sky. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them all. You are that head of of gold. After you, another kingdom will arise, inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything, and as iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. Just as you saw that the feet and the toes were partly of baked clay and, and partly of iron, so this will be a divided kingdom, yet it will have some of the strength of iron in it, even as you saw iron mixed with clay. As the toes are partly iron and partly clay, so this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. And just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united any more than iron mixes with clay. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of a mountain, not, but not by human hands, a rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, the gold to pieces. So here we have this statue, which Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream. And the statue had a head of gold. And Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar, he said, you are the head of gold. And so that would be Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar was the king of 
Babylon. And then we have the chest and arms of silver. And Daniel said that after Babylon, another kingdom would come, a little inferior, and that was the Medes and the Persians. And after them, another kingdom came, the midsection of bronze. You remember the next great kingdom? Greece. And after Greece, another kingdom came. And we know that was the legs of iron, the Roman Empire, which did split in two ultimately. So it's interesting. You have two legs there. Okay. So that was the great kingdoms of the world. And then he talked about the, the feet of clay and iron. And people have wondered, what does that mean? We'll talk about that in a little bit. But then we have that feet and clay being a revived Roman Empire. So you had the legs of iron, the Roman Empire, and then the feet of clay, which is iron and clay, being a revived Roman Empire. And then a rock will hit the whole thing. And the rock is Jesus when he returns. And when he returns, then he will do away with all these man-made kingdoms. But then getting back to that feat of clay and iron being a revived Roman Empire, people over the years have tried to figure out what will be that empire, right? How will it be put together? Some people thought it might be Napoleon or Hitler, but of course they, they failed completely to get a united empire. But it's interesting when the European Union came together that people wondered, is this it? And it's looking like it is. Because you look here at this map, and that's the area of the Roman Empire. And here on this map, you see the area of the European Union. And uh, uh, prophecy scholars have predicted when they saw this coming, and they said, this is going to most surely be the uh, revived Roman Empire. And I remember even in 1984, I was with a friend of mine. This was before the EU came into being. It was just kind of a common market back then. And I asked my friend who was from England, do you think that this European Union is going to happen? He said, no, only the elite people want it. It'll never, it'll never happen. And I said, well, Bible prophecy talks about a revived Roman Empire. I believe it is going to happen. And sure enough, it has, hasn't it? And I believe that this is fulfillment of Scripture and that this European Union in the future can become the dominant kingdom uh, leading other kingdoms. So in, in a sense, being the lead of a network of kingdoms that would dominate the world. Well, people say, well, how is that possible? Because we have the United States and the United States is is dominating the world at this point. Well, the United States has problems. One is that our economy is more on the edge than anyone realizes it. Even for the past years, I have been saying this. And uh, our dollar, our U.S. dollar, is really based on nothing. There's no gold. There's no silver backing up. It's just pieces of paper that people believe in. And the U.S. has accumulated a huge amount of debt. I believe now it's about $23 trillion, and it's going up all the faster, and now at, at breakneck speed, because of the uh, coronavirus. And this is really challenging the whole, the whole um, economy. And there's so much extra government aid and spending going on with coronavirus that... Uh, you know, there's even jokes like that Donald Trump has a giant money cannon and he's just firing this this money all over the place to 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 somehow help the economy that's been affected by coronavirus. A bleak report from the International Monetary Fund today says the global economy will contract by 3% this year, with highly developed economies like Canada's shrinking by more than 
That's $9 trillion off the global economy. They think it could be the worst downturn since the Great Depression. So let's bring in senior business correspondent Peter Armstrong. Peter, have we ever even seen anything remotely like this? No, I mean, you mentioned the Great Depression. I mean, they're even saying this is much worse than the 2008 financial crisis. And think about that. That was 10 years ago, and we still feel its impact. And back then, global GDP fell by just 1%. This is already forecast to be three times as bad. And the numbers, I mean, the numbers are just shocking. So what we could, we could see in the coming years as a result of all the spending in a very delicate economy already is that we could see banking systems collapse. We can see the U.S. economy really collapse. We can see the dollar, if they, you know, they're printing up so many now, eventually the dollar will just fall and, and it could become worthless virtually in the future. Yeah, some people think, well, that could never happen to the USA. But any country that overspends and just keeps printing up extra money ends up in a terrible situation. Like, uh, look at uh, Venezuela, which has had a socialist government for many years. As a result, they've gone into a lot of debt spending and they just print up more money, you know, to, to pay their debts. But then their money uh, goes down in value. Here's a picture of the amount of money in Venezuela it takes to buy those tomatoes. Can you believe it? Same thing happened in Zimbabwe. You know, they, they, they went into debt and they had no way to pay the debt. So they just print up extra dollars, print up extra money. And as a result, they also had inflation. And here's the amount of money there it takes to buy that chicken. In fact, their inflation got so bad that uh, they even ended up with a $100 trillion bill <laughs> that people could use. <laughs> so if you ever want to be a trillionaire, you can go to Zimbabwe. But see, this can happen in the USA very easily and other countries as well that are, that are just printing up money trying to uh, get out of debt uh, due to the economic situation. And people will are already you know, looking at gold and other things instead of U.S. dollars. So we can really see the end of the U.S. dominating the world and a worldwide depression. I believe out of this, the European Union will become more dominant. It's interesting. The European Union has a real spirit of of uh, secularism. You know, they, they don't have any acknowledgement of God. Uh, here's a picture, famous painting of the Tower of Babel. Now, the Tower of Babel was man's rebellion against God. We will build a tower to the heavens, right? Now, here is the European headquarters that's located in Strasbourg, Germany. You, you see it? It's modeled after the Tower of Babel. That's the spirit of the European Union, which is going to become more dominant, I believe. Their constitution does not mention God at all. At the same time, I believe we're going to see the rise of China. And there's some mention of what I believe to be China uh, in end times prophecy. So things are going to be changing. Uh, we are going to enter a time called the Great Tribulation, and that's going to last seven years. The seven years marked by when a great world leader makes some sort of a seven-year, a big seven-year treaty involving Israel. And then we have uh, this world leader. He's called the Beast. And the prophecy in the Bible is that this beast will rule in a worldwide government, um, and it will involve a lot of economic control. And this trend is now happening, the trend of globalism. Let me read this uh, verse about the, the beast. This is from Revelation 13, 5 to 7. The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies, and to exercise its authority for 42 months. 
It opened its mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. It was given power to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. And it was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. So here you have a person ruling over the whole world. And that would be only be possible uh, with globalism, by linking all the countries of the world together more. And we are seeing this trend. We are seeing unions right now forming. Different areas of the world are having different nations come together and they're forming these international unions. They're melding together. Of course, the European Union is the big model of that. You know, one time, even as long as, long ago as 1992, I was with a um, outreach team in Europe. We had a bus and we went through several different countries. I think about 13 different countries. And we never had to go through a border check. I mean, in most of those countries, uh, when we're in the European Union, because when we went through the European Union, it's all one place. And so we just coasted through all the borders. And this is going to happen in other parts of the world. It's in the works. We have talks of a North American Union with Canada, the U.S., and Mexico. They have a North American Union flag, and they have talked about a currency that will be called the Amero for the North American Union. So that when the dollar collapses, they're going to say, well, we're just going to replace that with the Amero. So they can use uh, the falling, collapsing economies to push this agenda. And there is talk of a Central American Union. There you can see a proposed flag and seal of the Central American African Union. There's the African Union flag. So that's being, people are working on that. And then you have a South American Union in the works. And there they are with their South American flag. And you have uh, the Association of Southeast Asian Countries. So they, they are working on their union. You see, this is happening all over the world. And there is the Arab Union, you know, North Africa and those Arab countries. So they can come together. And then you have places like India and China. India and China could really be a union within themselves because the po each of them has about one-sixth of the world population and uh, with a few small little neighboring countries uh, that could join in, that they could be almost unions within themselves. And so these 10 unions, there could be about 10 unions, and these could be the 10 horns mentioned in Revelation. So the 10 horns mentioned in Revelation could be 10 national unions. And we're seeing these unions in the process of formation. Uh, Revelation 17, 12 to 13. The 10 horns you saw are 10 kings who have not yet received the kingdom, but who for one hour will receive authority as kings along with the beast. They will have one purpose and will give their power and authority to the beast. So what, you'll, what will happen is, from the way things are looking at the moment, is that you could have 10 regions of the world, each with a leader, a king, and they'll all rule together. They'll all kind of meet and, you know, but eventually they will all give their authority to one person, the beast, and then he will be over the world. So here you see a map of the 10 economic unions with 10 leaders. This is, this is just a possibility that somebody made. I didn't make this map. Someone else made this as a kind of a, a projection of what these 10 unions could be. I think they're a little off. I don't think that India and Pakistan would be in the same union. They don't know India and Pakistan well enough. But... Um, but I think it's a rough look at what it could look like, these 10 unions. And then the leaders of these 10 unions would come together and then give their authority uh, to the beast. And then the beast would rule in a one world government. Look at uh, Revelation 13, 5 to 7. 
The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise its authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to blaspheme God, to slander his name and dwelling place and those who live in heaven. It was given power to wage war against God's saints and to conquer them. It was given authority to every tribe, people, language, and nation. Okay, we already covered that. So that's just good. That is the beast who will rule the world. Sometimes he's known as the Antichrist. And we see this trend towards one worldism, you know, trying to trying to combine the countries of the world together. There's an organization, for example, called the Council on Foreign Relations. Interestingly, their logo is a man on a white horse. <laughs> you may recall in Revelation, there's a man on a white horse. And basically their goal is to get a one world government. And, uh, but of course, they don't come out and just say that openly so much. And they have lots of forums and documents and books and journals and speakers. But their goal is, from people who have researched them, to have a one world government. And they have a lot of clout. In fact, if you are going to be a prominent politician, if you are going to be a, you know, a leader, likely you have to kind of play, play ball and and um, work with the Council of Foreign Relations. They have a lot of influence. Here, for example, is George Bush speaking at the Council of Foreign Relations. There's Obama, Council of Foreign Relations. There's Hillary Clinton, who ran against Trump in the last election, speaking at the Council on Foreign Relations. And uh, uh, Obama's Vice President Biden, who looks like he'll be running against Trump at the Foreign Council on Foreign Relations. Nancy Pelosi, who's the head of the U.S. House of Representatives. And of course, internationally, it's true as well. Man Mohan Singh, there he is, speaking at the Council of Foreign Relations. And of course, Modi is was there as well. So they have a lot of influence. Now, who did not speak at the Council of Foreign Relations? Who I, I, I cannot find a picture of this person speaking there. Donald Trump. Donald Trump is not a globalist. He is more of, uh, he's more pro-national. His philosophy is everyone should love their own country and everyone should try to improve and, and better their own country. Uh, he's not into this globalism and one worldism. And as a result, the powers that be who have a lot of influence in the media and other places are just attacking Donald Trump left and right for being an American patriot and not a globalist. A uh, video of President Trump is going viral. Yeah. Shocking. Uh, all right. So uh, <laughs> uh, right after he spoke to a group of business uh, leaders yesterday, there he is. He took a, a moment to uh, hug the American flag. He did that as you can't always get what you want played in the background. A lot of Trump supporters loved this. Check out this tweet from Marion who says, we love our awesome president and we know he loves us our country and God. So I don't know what else you could say about this one, guys. He is literally showing love to the American flag. Another group that would like to see a world government in the future would be the United Nations. The United Nations has a lot of influence. They even have their own army. And one thing I've noticed in recent years, for example, is... World Heritage Sites. There's the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, UNESCO. And UNESCO has established World Heritage Sites all over the world. Uh, the idea is to preserve them and so on, but uh, I have not really seen much improvement of those places. Uh, the only difference for me is I have to pay more to get in. Uh, I now have to pay a thousand rupees, maybe maybe it's 1500, I can't remember, to get into the Taj Mahal because it's a world heritage site. And these world heritage sites are all over the place. Here's a map of ones that are in India. I think there's more than this now. 
And here's a map of many that are in the world. And you see, the United Nations website says, these World Heritage Sites are the property of the whole world. See, they don't want you to go to Taj Mahal, for example, if you're Indian, and be proud of this as a, as a place, uh, a, a monument of India. They want you to see it as a monument for the whole world. They don't want you to think of yourself as an Indian citizen or an American citizen, but as a world citizen. And this is a way, a way to really push this whole concept that we're citizens of the world, the World Heritage Site. There's one in uh, Malaysia, Georgetown, that we went to. So you'll always hear them pushing this agenda of the planet and the world and the earth and all, you know, save, save the planet. You know, that's very much tied into into the environmental causes. It's never save India, save America. It's always save the earth, save the planet, because it's tied into globalism. They want you to think globally. You heard that slogan, think uh, globally, act locally, and that's and those sort of things. And they and of course they're working on uh, indoctrinating children into this as well. We have Captain Planet and the Planeteers. Our world is in peril. Gaia, the spirit of the Earth, can no longer stand the terrible destruction plaguing our planet. She sends five magic rings to five special young people, Quantic, from Africa, with the power of Earth. From North America, Wheeler, with the power of fire. From Eastern Europe, Linka, with the power of wind. From Asia, G, with the power of water. And from South America, Mati, with the power of heart. When the five powers combine, they summon Earth's greatest champion, Captain Planet. Go Planet! The power is yours! And of course, they want you to be a global citizen. And Bill Gates is big into this sort of movement. We want to ignite people's desire for connection. The power of digital technology can bring people together and break down barriers. That's where Global Citizen comes in. The way to connect millions of people and take action together to help create a better world. This year represents an incredible opportunity for people to show their support for these issues, to use their voice, to use their time, and to go beyond their own communities to connect with something larger. We need a movement of global citizens, from world leaders to people everywhere, to help solve the world's biggest problems. I've signed up, I hope you will too, and encourage your own network of people to become global citizens. And don't forget to celebrate Earth Day. Actually, that was yesterday, which also uh, happened to be our anniversary. So every year we don't celebrate Earth Day, we celebrate our anniversary instead. Now there's a special day this week. What day is it? Earth Day. We wanna challenge you to draw something about the Earth that you're super grateful for. What are you grateful for? Fresh water. Yeah, if we didn't have fresh water, we'd be in trouble. I'm super thankful for the mountains because we live in Utah and we have mountains everywhere you look. It's really beautiful. When you look outside, there's just a mountain in front of your yeah, face. Yeah, big giant mountain. <laughs> and then there have been uh, talks about a new world order. And of course, that's under the same spirit that we are citizens of the world, right? And we are the world. You know, the whole spirit of all of us becoming one. But really, that's priming us for a one world government.
And then in addition to this push for us to think globally and worldly and so on, there is a, a push towards government control over our lives, increasing where they want to monitor us more and control us more and keep track of us more, such as in India we've seen with the Aadhaar card. That's certainly part of that trend where everyone has to be identified and have a number and and where they are taking iris scans of people so they can all be tracked. And the U.S. is the same, you know. We've never had a national ID card. We've only just had state licenses. But what they've cleverly done is they make it now so each state license really ends up being your your national identity card. That little star up in the corner uh, indicates that you know your license has the proper computer chip and all, and that you're, it's now a national identity card. I don't have mine yet but I'll have to get one in order to fly in the U.S. Uh, unless I have my passport. And then coronavirus is certainly a wonderful opportunity for governments to assert control over our lives. Isn't that right? And so, you know, there's here's a saying here from the United Nations. This, above all, a human crisis that calls for solidarity. Do you know what that means? What solidarity means? It means you do what they tell you to do. It's an it's a it's a bid towards control. You know, practice social distancing, stay at home, wear your face mask. And I I'm I think it's good for us to obey obey these rules, uh, cooperate. Uh, that the, the Bible tells us to obey our leaders. But at the same time, maybe we should question, is all this necessary? I mean, a million people can die every year. Well, actually, I, actually, I think it's uh, about a million and a half every year die from tuberculosis in the world. Now, coronavirus so far has killed about 200,000, I believe. Hundreds of thousands can die every year from the flu and other things. So we have to wonder why all these extreme measures in this case. And this certainly can be a bid towards government control. Why would they why would they want to shut down the economy if if this is if this is not a serious issue? This to me is a power play of control. If there's one thing that this is showing me is how the governments could take control of the people anytime, anywhere, any place. Hey, Daniela, remember those demonstrations in Hong Kong that were going on continually and that were headline news virtually every day? Don't hear about those anymore. Hey, you French people. No more. You're not allowed to go marching in the street. Same thing in Italy. They had these other movements going on, the new sardine movement and all. You're not allowed to do that anymore. So to me, this is government control. And why they're doing it, again, as their track record proves, they're narcissistic sociopaths and psychopaths. And now they're in charge and they're bringing out their sickness and putting it onto the entire populations. And then we have the mark of the beast. And this is mentioned in Revelation 13, 16 to 18. It also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or their foreheads so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the person who has insight calculate the number of the beast, for it is the, the number of a man. The number is 666. And uh, by the way, man's number in the Bible is six, because man was created on the sixth day. So 666 is kind of like the Trinity, so it's kind of like man claiming to be God. And there is a prophecy that the Antichrist will actually claim to be God. But you see that in that verse, it talks about how people could not buy or sell unless they had a mark 
on their right hand or forehead. Well, you can buy or sell with cash. So obviously, the first step towards preventing people from buying and selling without being controlled is to get rid of cash. And there has been a trend around the world of getting rid of cash. And in a number of countries of the world, even now, on uh, um, basically, they have stopped using cash for the most part. It's, it's pretty rare for people in certain countries to use cash. Of course, one country that's been behind on this trend is India, where people have preferred to use cash. And what ends up happening, happening in India? Demonetization. Back, uh, I think that was 2016. And I, I remember that uh, that night that Prime Minister Modi, I was there in, in the Bangalore and Prime Minister Modi announced the 500 rupee notes and the 1000 rupee notes are no longer legal, legal after midnight tonight. And so um, I thought, well, I, I want to use up a 500 rupee note, so I'll rush to the petrol bunk and get some petrol with my 500 rupee note while I still can. So I went there and everyone else had the same idea. And it was full of people with, you know, all in a panic trying to get rid of their 500 notes. And they said, no, we're not going to take them. We don't have change anymore. So even that uh, didn't work. And uh, the 500 rupee notes and the 1,000 notes were a huge part of the, of the currency. And so this wrecked havoc. Now, what Modi and others said was that the reason for this demonetization was to get rid of black money, you know, corrupt money that's stored in suitcases and hidden away and hidden away from the government. And they thought, well, if we can change the bills, we can get rid of the, the black money because everyone has to now change at the bank and come out in the open. And so, but once this whole thing happened and they began to look at the situation, they didn't find much black money at all. And and they stopped talking about black money. I, I, I noticed that they started saying, go cashless. You know, you need to go cashless. That's what you need to do. Go cashless. And the companies began to really promote it like crazy. Go cashless India. You know, because... I believe the reason for demonetization was not black money at all. The reason was to push India into cashlessness, because if we're going to have uh, this mark of the beast, we have to get everyone uh, out of cash. And then we, we see now with coronavirus, you know, they're saying, oh, you know, cash is dirty. There are germs. There are germs can be all over that cash. You never know who's been handling that money. You could catch coronavirus from handling cash. So it's better yeah, better for you and, and for the people you work with if you just go cashless. Cash in your wallet. We touch it. We pass it between people. Some people even lick their fingers as they count it. Is that a problem? Viewers from Plymouth to Gross Point ask, can you get coronavirus from handling money? The answer is, we don't know, but it's worth thinking about. Since mid-February, the Bank of China has been either destroying bills or disinfecting their cash with ultraviolet light and high temperatures, then storing it for 7 to 14 days before re-releasing it back into the circulation. That is based on studies that have shown bacteria and viruses can survive on money. Now, there is no study that shows the COVID-19 virus can survive on cash. However, an unidentified representative from the World Health Organization reportedly told a British newspaper that cash could be contributing to the spread of COVID-19. Now, the U.S. Treasury has not made any statement on U.S. currency. Until this issue is properly studied, I would recommend a common sense approach. Where possible, use cashless options. When you do handle cash, wash your hands or use hand sanitizer afterward, especially if you're about to handle food. So governments don't like people using cash because they can't control it, they can't track it, so they can tax all of it and so on. They prefer you move to credit cards or debit cards. 
And of course, these have become much more. Po- I, I I saw them become much more popular in India due to demonetization and other things. And it's more convenient. And uh, then Facebook and Amazon and Google and Apple—they've all come out with their own little debit cards, making things so convenient to go cashless. But of course, these cards have a problem, and that is they can be uh, they can be copied. Uh, you've heard about the scams in ATM machines with cameras and with uh, false keyboards and false scanners. Uh, so this makes and and cards can be stolen, and so this can make cards um, quite dangerous. Uh, I mean, quite um, risky to use. And so now the trend is for us to buy and and sell things through our phone. And I, I heard in China everyone's doing this now, and in Europe they're you know they've gone completely cashless, and that is going to the store and just using your phone. And also doing cash transfers between phones, and the easier this becomes, the more it will be done. So you could go to a fruit seller in a village and just pay him or her through your phone. So, but the problem with phones is they can be stolen, and I know that all that all well because a few months ago my phone got stolen. I was walking from the main. Bus station in downtown Santiago to the metro, and somewhere in that little five-minute walk or ten-minute walk, my phone was gone. Even though I was, you know, occasionally trying to guard it, but in the chaos of things, someone took it. We found out shortly after that there was actually a gang of thirty people working in that central area, uh, stealing phones full time. So I probably never had a chance. So. Phones ultimately uh, can be risky as well. So, what's the next step after that? Is microchips, microchips to be implanted in our skin. In other words, all the information, instead of being on a credit card or in your phone, would be in a microchip, and that could be implanted in the skin, and therefore it could not be stolen or copied. Uh, and you, you, and people could track you if you're kidnapped, and all sorts of advantages there. Um, and there is already a chip there. We they have that can be implanted in the skin, about the size of a grain of rice, complete with an antenna and all the different parts. And they are getting smaller and smaller too. Millions of pets have been identified with microchips. So if your dog gets lost, your cat gets lost, they find it. Uh, they could scan it and get it returned. And then, in uh, 2004, they made microchips legal for humans, and this is becoming more uh, experimented with to use microchips uh, for humans for various purposes. One purpose they have promoted is the medical area that. You know, if you have a medical condition, uh, it's good to have a microchip so that if you're, you know, if you pass out in the street, you're taken to the hospital, they could scan you and have all your information. To think something so small can connect you to everything that matters. When your life and all you love are on the line, HealthLink is always with you. When every second counts in the emergency room, providing immediate access to your medical records. Because Bob has trouble remembering all his medications. Because I'm in love with my kids' kids. Because my car lost control while driving. Because now, I'm looking out for both of us. Because I have diabetes, but it doesn't have me. Because I spend my life in the ER trying to save yours. And the chips can be used for security clearances and purchases and things like that. And some uh, companies 
and people have been trying that out. Apparently about 10,000 people have received a microchip in Sweden. When Elias Brodberger goes to work, he doesn't need ID and he doesn't need money. In fact, much of what he needs to get through the day is hidden right there, just below the surface in his hand. You like to touch it? Yeah. yeah. Oh, weird, yeah, it's yeah. like a grain of rice. Yeah, a grain of rice. Embedded in his hand is a microchip that serves as his keys, his ID, and his wallet. Yeah, it's all in chips, so I use it like to get around the building. Buy snacks. Yeah, exactly. Let's buy some snacks. Exactly. So I can't open it? No. Okay. So what I need to do is I need to first blip my chip, and it will log me in, mm -hmm. and from there I get access to the fridge. Popular TV shows like Black Mirror have imagined chips as part of a dystopian future. Install ingrained procedure with local anesthetic and you're good to go. In Sweden, the microchips are already here. The microchip implants use the same technology that's in contactless credit cards. Which have made cash pretty much obsolete in Sweden. No cash. At this tech fair, a chipping event for those on the cutting edge, merging their hands with this new technology. I thought it would be fun, right? The process is simple and swift. A pinch of the skin, and in a matter of seconds, the chip is inserted. The transformation is complete. As for the pain... I barely felt it. But even in this nation of early adopters, not everyone is racing to get chipped. I feel less human. I will feel like a robot. I think, I mean, it's so much more data can go into this, you know, when it's in your body. There's no central registry tracking how many people are chipped, but biohacker Hannes Wellblood estimates between five and 10,000. In the future, do you think everyone is going to be chipped? I think it will be voluntary, but I am certainly convinced that millions of people will find it very, very valuable to have a smart device under their skin. Human microchipping may be our future, but in Sweden, it's already reality. Sarah Harmon, NBC News, Stockholm. And also in USA, um, some people are trying out the microchips. Todd Westby might just have a hand in shaping the future. The CEO of vending machine maker Three Square Market literally opening doors with automation that's turning some workers into high-tech machines of sorts. This is a lot more than just some sort of novelty to you. It is. It's reality. With all of the interest we've seen in it, I can tell this is definitely the future. By injecting a rice-sized microchip into a willing employee's hand, all kinds of data can be programmed into them, from driver's licenses and medical ID cards to logging onto computers. You have to hold it up to something such as this. Even purchasing snacks in the company break room. More than 50 employees have volunteered. How much did that hurt? Didn't really hurt a lot. A third holding off for now. It kind of freaks me out a little bit. Some experts suggest caution. Among the concerns, ID theft, health, and whether the chips can be tracked by GPS. Most people don't really understand how this technology works, what data is collected, how it's stored, or who might be able to get access to it legally or illegally. Three Square says their employees cannot be tracked by satellite. Melissa Timmons was skeptical, but is now chipped. Yeah, right now it's only to buy a candy bar and get in our building, but there's a lot more that's going to be, be coming with it. Chips off the new block. I'll choose to pay with my hand here. Cool and technology once again hand in hand. Ron Mott, NBC News, River Falls, Wisconsin. Now, these, these microchips are not the mark of the beast because they are not required yet to buy or sell. They're not being put in the right hand or forehead. And so that's it's not the, the mark of the beast at this point. It certainly shows we're getting closer, though. Here's another interesting aspect is the barcodes that you see on products all over the place. And the way these barcodes work is every two, every pair of lines represents a number, like a, like a thick line separated by a thin space from another, from a thin line would represent a certain number, okay? Or a thick line with a thick space and a thick line. Each pair represents a number. And there's different patterns for different numbers. And sometimes there's 
multiple patterns for different numbers, so it can be a little complicated. Uh, but one thing is actually consistent on these barcodes. They one one aspect is that they most of the barcodes have three guard bars. One on the left, one in the middle, one on the right, and they are all a little longer than the other barcodes, okay? Another thing that's consistent on these barcodes is that a thin line separated by a thin space from another thin line always represents the number six. So there you can see on this barcode, you know, three of those lines, the the the, the the left, middle, and end, you know, the guard bars. And you see they're a thin line, thin space, thin line. So each of them actually is the number six, though they're not labeled. So many, almost all the barcodes have six, six, six. Uh, occasionally the pattern is different, but, but many of them do. You can have a look at different products. Now, I'm not saying that the barcode is the mark of the beast or that the barcode is, you know, evil in itself, but it does show an interesting link between computer commerce and the number 666. So when this mark does come out, if you're around, don't receive it. Just say no. The Bible clearly says that those who receive the mark of the beast will be judged. Uh, here we see in Revelation 14, 9-12, a third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives its mark on their forehead or on their hand, they too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured out full strength into the cup of his wrath. They will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. And there will be no rest day or night for those who worship the beast and its image, or for anyone who receives the mark of its name. This calls for patient endurance on the parts of the people of God who keep his commandments, his commands, and remain faithful to Jesus. Revelation 14, 9 to 12. So anyone who gets the mark will be condemned, and so uh, Christians will not get the mark. And also those who refuse to get the mark and refuse to worship the beast, many of them will be killed. Revelation 24. And I saw the souls of those who have been beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their forehead, foreheads or their hands. So, so that's the trend towards the mark of the beast. And I believe that we will see more cashlessness. You'll see people using their phones and credit cards more. And eventually you'll see cash disappear, even in India, even in the most remote village. Eventually, uh, cash will not be there. Okay, on to other some other prophecies that we can look for. The Jewish temple being rebuilt. Uh, this is mentioned in Daniel 12, 11. From the time that the daily sacrifice is abolished and the ab abomination that causes desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 days. So it's believed from this prophecy that there will be a rebuilt Jewish temple complete with animal sacrifices in the end times. And there are some Jews who wish to do this, but they can't do it at this point because... The Dome of the Rock and a nearby mosque are in that area of the where the temple would be, uh, according to what they know now. And so they cannot rebuild the temple. They don't. The Jews do not control the temple site. But something might happen in the future that maybe this Dome of the Rock will be destroyed or some deal will be made with the Muslims. and Or maybe they'll find out that the actual temple site is a little different from what they thought. We don't know. But when it happens, then the temple could be rebuilt. But right now it's blocked. But there are a small group of Jews who have been rehearsing things like the animal sacrifice and the temple rituals in preparation for the day that they will be able to 
rebuild uh, the Jewish temple. So that's something you can look for, you know, the, the, the movement towards that. Another prophecy is that Russia and others will attack Israel and be defeated. And this is all mentioned in Ezekiel chapter 38. I don't have time to read that, but it lists different nations that will attack Israel. And, you know, years ago, many of these nations were not the nations that would attack Israel. In other words, they were allied with Israel. But now, most all these nations are not friendly with Israel. And it it, it is interesting that we could see this happen. And... Uh, and somehow these this big alliance against Israel will be defeated. So that's another thing we can look for, you know, a possible attack on Israel or when that will happen. Another prophecy that will happen at some point is the rapture of the church. According to God's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not uh, predicate those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven and with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and that with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So, uh, first, first Thessalonians 4, 15 and 16. So that's talking about the rapture of the church. It's believed that Christians will be raptured to heaven before the wrath of God comes. Now, some people think the wrath of God is that whole seven-year tribulation. Others think it's part of that tribulation, just maybe the last third. Some think that the rapture will happen just before or just as Jesus is returning. So, we're not sure. But at some point, the church will be raptured to heaven. Uh, probably the, the majority of the people uh, who are into the end times teachings believe it will happen before the seven years. Uh, I do not. I think it'll. I think we will experience a lot of tribulation, and probably will go up in the midst of maybe two thirds the way through the seven years before God's wrath happens. But um, I will show you a video of the rapture, <laughs> and but this is based on the belief that it would happen before the seven years. In other words, it would happen while things were still quite normal, and that could. Uh, cause uh, buses and cars possibly driven by Christians to crash and that's so so I'll show you that just to um, just for fun Concern is now mounting over an apparent war brewing in the Middle East 28,000 militias stand lined up as this confrontation between Muslims and Israelis comes to a dangerous conclusion. things are going not too long before the second coming, yeah, Ellen? Oh, Harold, come on. Stop being so dramatic. Excuse me, young lady, would you happen to have change for this dollar? Uh, yeah, I think so. Reports of another tsunami wreaking havoc off the coast of French Polynesia. This just in, the Joint Chiefs of Staff have declared DEFCON 3 as a result of the latest terror attack. This attack occurring in a government building near the Resistol Cold Fusion Reactor. We just lost our feed. I'm getting reports of a, of a massive nuclear explosion in New York. Pandemonium. Havoc. Chicago. Blackout. Los Angeles. There seems to be a state of emergency. That's a little preview for you of the rapture. Actually, I I think that the rapture will happen uh, into the tribulation, probably two thirds of the way through, perhaps during a time of 
persecution of the Christians. So I, I personally don't expect crashing buses and crashing airplanes and that sort of thing. But uh, we don't know. So um, I'll have to end part four here due to the length of, of this. And we will continue with last day's prophecies, uh, finishing up with that uh, the next session. And then we'll talk about indestructibility of the Bible and then how the Bible has changed lives. So we'll see you then.